All right, good morning, everyone. Today we continue in our study of the book of Esther. Open up your Bible to uh, book of Esther. If you're new to the Bible, if you open up just kind of in the very middle of your Bible and start turning to the left, you'll probably hit Psalms and before Psalms, Job, and then you come to Esther. Ten chapters, and today we're looking at Esther 2, and let me just warn you, Esther 2 reads like an episode from the reality TV show The Bachelor. Now, uh, maybe you're not familiar, which is probably a good thing, if, well, with this show called The Bachelor. It's a little bit cheesy, but, you know, if, if you understand it, it, it's basically about a guy who, uh, he, he's supposedly an eligible bachelor, and uh, the show begins with uh, uh, several love interests in the show, usually about 25 women that over the course of the season he gets to know, and at the end of the season he supposedly chooses one as his wife that he's going to propose to, though not many have actually proposed, but nevertheless that's, that's kind of the idea of the show. So he, he's getting to know them and, 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 and picks them, and if you can imagine that. I love a comment that Jimmy Kimmel, late night comedian, said about The Bachelor. <laughs> He says, The Bachelor is the show that answers the question, how much wine do you have to drink until the guy making out with 20 different women seems like he'd make a good husband? <laughs> I think that's pretty good. And you get a lot of insight into you know, the women throughout the show. Uh, there's a couple of, of classic quotes through different seasons. And I just have to read some of these to you because they're so funny. But one, one quote is, uh, don't be weirded out. I'm kind of... A stalker. That would really commend you to someone. And then here's another one. I, and I feel like I'm not being myself. This would be like one, one of the ladies. On the show. I feel like I'm not being myself, but I'm trying really hard to be myself. But because I'm trying so hard to be myself, it's making me even more not myself. Some of you guys can relate to that maybe. And then uh, my favorite here is, uh, this is from Sarah Welch from season seven. She says, People are mean to me, you know, like sometimes when, because of the way I look, you, you know, and, and, I, and I mean, it sounds like so stupid, but like, like people hate me because I'm beautiful. I mean, like, no matter what, like, you know, th there is just a huge prejudice and racist. <laughs> well, nothing's new under the sun, because uh, if you go back to about the late fifth century uh, B.C., what you find is an episode right out of The Bachelor in Esther chapter 2. And uh, also you find kind of a Miss Persia pageant. If you remember, if you were with us last week, we, we saw that King Ahasuerus, that's the Hebrew name, the Greek name was Euxes the Great. Okay, Euxes. All right, so th this king has a queen, a wife, who fails to come when summons, and she is dismissed as queen. And now, as we open up to chapter 2, the counselors and advisors to the king are going to encourage him to search the entire empire, world empire, for the new queen. Now, before we go any further, let me just say this, that Esther is going to end up being queen, okay? I'm just going to, like, just tell you. Now, most of you are aware of that. But if you're new to the Bible and you think, man, there's like, who's going to end up being queen? Well, the name of the book is Esther. <laughs> and Esther's going to end up being queen. But what's interesting for our purposes today is like, how does this come about? Because one of the things that the people in the book of Esther, as well as the people in this room, have to ask is the question like, how does, how does certain things come about? Like, how is it that Esther, a Jewish woman in this Persian empire, come to be queen? Um, how is it that Mordecai, who is her cousin, ends up spoiling an assassination plot? How is it that certain events happen? And is it sometimes like that events are just appear to be random? You may remember from last week, we asked the question, that in a book where the, the name of God never appears anywhere in the book, in a godless story, are events just kind of random because they can kind of appear that way. But in God's story, God is actually at work arranging things with a, for a reason. And so you're, you're kind of like asking that question. You're trying to figure it out. Remember, that's the big distinction with the book of Esther. You never find any mention of God anywhere in the book. In fact, you don't even find you know, references to prayer, uh, like going to the synagogue, sacrifices, nothing like that. 
So in a godless story, it feels like, man, it's just random events. But as I think you're going to see again today, as we did last week, is that is God actually at work silently before these things? So that, that's what we're going to look at. So um, this, this is the, um, the narrative. We're going to read through this. I'm going to just kind of comment as I m- make my way through the narrative. And let me preview it for you. The narrative moves in, in, in three different ways. First of all, uh, the king is actually seeking a queen. All right. And then second, the king selects a queen. And then surprisingly, the king is saved by the queen. That's kind of the movement of the narrative. So let's look at this first idea that the king is selecting a queen. If you want to follow along, Esther chapter 2. It says, after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, remember that was his anger toward Vashti because she did not call when he summoned her. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. You might just mentally circle the word beautiful. Literally, it's the idea of, uh, of a beautiful of form. Uh, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins. Same word, same phrase, beautiful of form. Beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them and let the young woman who uh, pleases the king, let the young woman who pleases the king, the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king and he did so. All right, so as I pointed out to you, when you consider the qualities of the queen, like what we're looking for someone who's really diplomatic, who can really bring countries together, uh, who's going to like be a great counsel to the king because she's like, you don't get any of that. What are the qualities? That she's beautiful of form. That's the That's the qualification for queen that they're looking for. This idea pleases the king. Now, we've already learned from chapter one that this king is uh, not a big fan of uh, of women. Like the way he uh, treated Vashti, uh, the way that his counselors are appealing to him now and choosing the next wife. But anyway, this this is the, the qualification of the queen. Okay, as we keep reading, we're going, to int- we're going to be introduced to one key character, Mordecai, and another key character, Esther. Verse 5, now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, that's the capital of the Persian Empire at this time, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now his pedigree here is going to be really important. Factor in later. Uh, let me uh, suffice it to say that not only is he a Jew, but he, of the 12 tribes, he's of the tribe of Benjamin. And he's related to a man named Kish, who was the father of the first king of Israel, Saul. And that's going to be inter- uh, very interesting in the future. So just kind of tuck that away. And so he says uh, uh, that he's a Benjamite who had been carried away, verse 6, from Jerusalem, among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther. So Hadassah would obviously be the Hebrew name, Esther the Greek. Uh, That is Esther, the daughter of his uncle. For she had neither father nor mother. And the young woman had, guess what? A beautiful figure. Same phrase, beautiful of form. She had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And so when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. Okay, so uh, having kind of seen the qualities of uh, the queen, like qualifications of the queen. Then you see the qualities of Esther. So the, the narrator here, the storyteller, it says, look, Esther met the qualifications. She was beautiful of form. Uh, your English translation, if you're in the ESV, that she was, had a, a beautiful figure, that she was lovely to look at. Now, they may be limited qualifications, but the point is, is that who the king was looking for, Esther really fit the bill. It uh, it kind of, um, I I think, gives us the opportunity to think about our first application this morning, which is this. 
is that when it comes to, uh, you know, what, what God is up to here, God designs our lives to prepare us for his purposes. That God designs our lives to prepare us for his purposes. In other words, uh, God is up to something here, primarily to preserve his people who are going to be threatened with, um, you know, annihilation. And that what he does is that he's got uh, this woman, Esther, who is going to meet the very thing the king is looking for that will eventually uh, exalt her into a position of influence. And so what we see is that God oftentimes, and in your life and mine as well, that God designs our lives. He's preparing us for his purposes. Now, this is an amazing thing because um, Esther did not have a great life. You may think she becomes queen in the world empire. But think about it. First of all, she's of a people that are in captivity because of their rebellion against God. Okay, her mother and her father are dead. They either died on the way into captivity or sometime during the captivity. So she's orphaned. All right, she's in a foreign country, foreign culture. She's being raised by her cousin, her older cousin, Mordecai. It's not a great life. We don't really know how she felt about being recruited into the harem. We're not told. It's not, we don't get any kind of comment. But we are told that it's not that she volunteered. Hey, look at me. She says she was taken like many other women. And so we don't know really how she felt about that. Nevertheless, she finds herself in a harem. And as we're going to see shortly, like she's going to have a time with the king. And the king is going to like be really pleased with her. But suffice it to say right now is that God has prepared her for his purposes. Like she meets the qualifications. So in the same way, like God does that with us. And sometimes what God does in preparing us for the way he wants to use us is that it involves sorrow. It involves things that are hard. God uses us in all kinds of different ways for all kinds of different reasons. So you may be familiar with the metaphor of tapestry. So when you look at the back of tapestry, you see something like this picture. You know, like you've got these strings and they just seem kind of random and you, you've got knots and, and, and you can't really make any sense out of it. Like what's the image? And then when you turn the tapestry over, you see, especially in the case of Esther, a crown. Like that God is working to place her And for all of us, when you look at, from the perspective of earth, what many times feels like a godless story, because we can't see God, we can't hear God, we're not sure what God is doing. It just feels like from our earthly perspective that our lives are just kind of a random series of events. And sometimes they're really painful events. Sometimes they're really sorrowful as well as times where God allows us to succeed. And and so he starts weaving like our experiences and different things about our life together for his purposes. Many of you know the name Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was a a professional watchmaker uh, in the Netherlands at the outbreak of World War II. And so uh, she and her family are involved in rescuing children from being taken by the Nazis and especially worked among the physically challenged, the mentally challenged. Incredible what God was doing with them, but word got out. The Nazis uh, arrested her. She eventually spent time in a Nazi concentration camp. She was a believer who maintained her faith that God was always up to something. In fact, she writes these words, My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper and I the underside. It's a matter of perspective. Now till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly, will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why? The dark threads are as needful as the weaver's skillful hand, as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Imagine what it would be like in your life if you believed that all the hard things in your life, the things that have left you bitter, 
and resentful about, that God could somehow weave these things together to do something huge and big and glorious if you would but believe and give yourself to that. Consider what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, what he says there really reflects this point that we're trying to make. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in his introductory remarks in this letter, he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and watch this, God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that, that's purpose, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Are you getting this? For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Okay, so you look at the repeated word there, comfort, and you understand that Paul has a perspective, doesn't he? That this isn't a godless story with apparently random events that this is really a godly story and that God is using the events in my life to like, prepare me to be used by him in the lives of other people so that the comfort that I've received from God, I can use to comfort other people. Imagine if you saw your life that way. Like maybe a failed marriage. Like maybe that, that you, you got passed over for a job. Like maybe you, you, you went for quite a while without job, like whatever uh, situation that you may go through, that you were hurt, betrayed by a friend, whatever circumstances in your life, that God can somehow weave those together when you trust that he's able to do that, that he is telling a story. And it's different from the side of the tapestry that we see. But when you turn it over, he's putting together this beautiful story, ultimately of his glory and our good. Uh, God designs our lives to prepare us for his purposes. Esther was designed by God for a role that she had no idea that she would play for uh, God's purposes. Now, as we come back to the narrative, we move to the king selecting a queen. And so we pick up with uh, verse 9 here. Uh, well, re recalling verse 8 here, it says that, you know, that she gets gathered into the harem as well. In verse 9, and the young woman pleased him and won his favor. Now, I want you to mentally circle the word favor. Just kind of keep that in mind. It's a very important word. It says that uh, this young woman pleased him. This would be Haggai, the keeper of the harem. He ple she pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with cosmetics and her portion of food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace... Um, and he advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. And Esther had not made known her people or, or kindred, that she was Jew, that is. Uh, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying. Now, it'd be a lot of fun to kind of just talk about, like, how much time is involved in a woman beautifying herself. Well, I won't go there. Some of the men need to, like, spend a little more time than you normally spend trying to look good, but... Anyway, so after this, this time passes, a period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went to the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz, I think that's his name, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. Okay, so you're in the harem, you go to be with the king, it's kind of like your audition, I guess, your interview. You kind of go back into a second group here. 
and she, who was in charge of the concubines, and she would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. And when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had uh, uh, taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now, Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. That's our second time, okay, mentally circle. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight. There it is a third time. In his sight more than all the other virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And then the king gave a great feast for all the officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. And he also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. The king is very happy. He's generous because he's found a wife. She's beautiful of form. Now, what's interesting here is in the selection of, of the queen, uh, there's a couple of things going on. This, uh, this word that I called to your attention is important, this word favor. For instance, the first time it appears, it's, it's, a, it's a very important word in the Old Testament. It's the word hesed. Uh, some of you know that Hebrew name. It's, it's a reference to God's covenant loyal love. That when God loved Israel, when he chose the people of Israel, he talked about his love, his steadfast love. And it was an expression of his covenant loyalty to these people, his steadfast love. And so this word right away would have grabbed the attention of all Hebrews to, to reference. That, okay, wow, that's the kind of love. That's the kind of favor that God has toward us. Now, the second time, that you see the word favor when it says that Esther was growing in favor of all, everyone. That word favor, though translated the same way in English, is a different uh, Hebrew word, just as significant. It's the Hebrew word chain. It, it's the word grace. That uh, she was growing in grace. Now, if there was two words, if there were two words that would ever call attention or make reference or allude to God, the God of the Bible, it would be these two words, hesed and hain, favor and grace. And so it, that second occurrence is that word. And then finally, when you get to the third occurrence, when it talks about the king's response to Esther, I want you to note that it says in verse 17 that the king loved Esther more than all the women and she won what? Grace and favor. And here both of those words appear, hain and hesed. So you get hesed, Hain, and then the two of them together. And literarily, this author, writing under the inspiration direction of God himself, is making a point where he's practically screaming the involvement of God in this positioning of Esther. It's incredible. The, uh, these words are so significant. In fact, I would just suggest to you this application that God distinguishes our lives to position us for his purposes. God distinguishes Okay, that he, he actually like sets us apart for, in, in different ways to uh, uh, participate in his purposes for what he's doing in the world. He distinguishes our lives to position us for his purposes. How about the experiences that you've had? We talked a little bit about that already. But think about what you might consider the assets in your life. Uh, your education. Like perhaps God gave you the opportunity to pursue you know, making your way through school and then, you know, in the undergrad, maybe you got your master's, maybe a PhD, but whatever, like you, you feel like you've got some education things. Is it possible that you would look at that and say, you know what? That was God that allowed me to have that opportunity. You may think, no, Danny, like I worked my way all through this. I'm not talking about that, what, like how you did it, but that ultimately like that God in like overseeing your life, like he made that possible. Uh, that the job that you have, uh, that, uh, you know, the friends and relationships that you have, your personality, your gifting and your wiring, like all that ultimately is God in his design for you, really distinguishing you from others for his unique purposes, for your unique participation in his purposes. How about where you live? 
How about the people who live by you? That God has placed there. If you see your whole life that, man, God is using me for his purposes. And he's, he's designed my life, preparing me. He distinguishes my life to position me in certain ways to have influence. Imagine like how that would change your life. Like how you would look differently at, at the job that you have. And so instead of just evaluating, like, is my boss nice to me? Are my wages fair? You're thinking, God, you've placed me here. Like, God, you're up to something in the lives of the people around me. What are you up to? Like, I want to be on the same page with you. I don't want to live my life acting like this is a godless story, that God is absent. And my life is just a series of events, and I hope I have good luck. Or do you live your life like, okay, I'm in God's story. That God's up to something huge and grand and that he actually gives me an opportunity to participate in what he's doing. And so all of who I am, all that I bring to the table is all designed. It's all part of what God is doing in my life. Like I'm going to think about life and process life a lot differently. So we have some new neighbors. They just moved in this week. Sanir and Rohini. Okay, they're from India, and we've had a couple of conversations with them already, kind of learning how to pronounce their name. And, and I'm thinking, Kathy and I, and I we, we can't help but think, like, God, I wonder where these people are spiritually. I wonder if we're going to have a chance to connect with them and share the gospel with them. Because we believe that where we live and the people that we live next to is not a random event, but instead maybe something very much arranged by God. That, the book of Acts tells us that, where Paul's talking into, to the Ephesians. And he basically says, or actually it, it's in the, um, uh, his uh, message on Mars Hill, where he talks about how God arranges our lives and places people so that they can find God. God positions people. Do you know that God may have put your neighbors next to you so that you could share the gospel with them? All of this speaks to what God does. He, he prepares us. He designs our lives. He positions us. He distinguishes our life for his purposes. That's what's going on here. As we come back to the narrative, uh, the king has now selected his queen. So like, you know, the show, the season ends. The bachelor, like he proposes, uh, the queen's on board, the position is filled. But then before the chapter ends, we get this incredible, incredible scene. Uh, which uh, uh, the, the spotlight moves to Mordecai. In verse 19, it says, Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. And Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In, uh, in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Okay, so Mordecai uncovers an assassination plot on King Ahasuerus. He, in turn, tells Queen Esther, what he's discovered, Queen Esther goes before the king and tells him he has it searched out and the bad guys are executed. Now, this is an incredible event. And what you need to know is that even though there's no real fanfare that takes place right now, Mordecai is not recognized. He's not rewarded. He's not promoted. Like he gets no attention from this. But later, as many of you know, it's going to factor in in a very significant and relevant way to the events of what's going to take place in the future. And I think about that, how often maybe in our lives, things happen or things that we did, and like no one really recognizes that, or it seems to go unnoticed and unappreciated. And you just kind of wonder, like, what's up with that? Because sometimes we're tempted to self-promotion. Hey, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you are aware, but I pretty much put down an assassination plot against the key. And you, you might want to just 
I, I know, I know. No, you don't need to thank me. I mean, we can kind of, with this false humility, find ways that others know. But notice that that doesn't take place here. And I think it does give us the chance to entertain this thought that God determines our times for promoting his purposes. That our times, like when we're promoted, when we're not, our times when we're recognized and when we're not, our times for whatever ways that he's going to use us, like the timing of that is fixed by him. So for Mordecai, not a lot of recognition right now. The time for the life of Mordecai was in God's hands. And you know, it's true for you and me. God's times for what he's going to do in our life, like it's for you and me. Some of you applied for a teaching job this year and you didn't get it. Or you didn't get the school that you wanted. Uh, Some of you have applied for colleges that you didn't get in. Uh, uh, Some of you have had different situations where what you were hoping to see happen didn't happen. In that the person of faith, the person who lives with the perspective that life is not random, it's not a godless story, it's God's story, that you live with just this default faith that what happens in my life is no surprise to God, whether he assigns or just allows things that happen that he's going to weave together for his purposes. And when you believe that, it will radically change the way you process life. It just will. So for Mordecai here, we don't get his response, and he gets no response from the administration, and that's just kind of where it is. So the, uh, God's times are in his hands for how he, he promotes us and uses us. Uh, this morning, we showed you a video of uh, trips down to Piedras Negras, and uh, we're having another trip here soon. But let me tell you one story from that trip. Uh, there's a woman uh, by the name of Sonia. Uh, Sonia uh, was actually on the city council there at Piedras, and uh, she had some influence. She's not a believer at this time, and uh, she was elevated to that position and, and really had some, some, some influence specifically by our teams who were, who were going down there. For instance, um, they, they went down there and they would set up this clinic, and each time it's a kind of a potentially a different location just in that area. And at this point, they had kind of a large concrete area that they were going to set up the clinic and the ministry to kids. But man, with the heat and all, they were really wanting to some cover. And so they're, they're approaching the city and, and, and uh, they're talking about like, is it possible somehow to get tents? And, and, and what Sonia makes happen is that there was another event in the city that had all this covering. And so she tells her city workers after that event is over, like during the night, to go and transfer all that to the location where our people are going to be. And so they show up to uh, do the clinic and they have all this covering. Like that was a pretty incredible thing. Now then what's more is that she's promoted. She gets actually voted as, as to be mayor in the city. It's, uh, at that point was kind of mayor pro tem, mayor elect. And so like she's being promoted even to greater influence in the city. So the pastor that we interface with down there, Pastor Joe, he gathers other pastors in the city and they meet with her just to kind of pray for her because of her influence. And, and basically she had such a positive view toward the church and, and even our church coming up there to work that she said, man, you guys do good work for the city. I want to do good for you. And as the pastors gather around, Pastor Joe says to her, you know, you've had favor on our church. And now I want you to know that God has favor on you. That God wants to connect with you. And in that meeting, he shares the gospel and she prays to receive Christ. And so now she's not only the first woman who's been mayor in the city, she's the first Christian in that position to our knowledge. And she's in this position of influence. And, you know, that's, that's translated to, you know, real specific things. I'll just tell you one story. For example, like when, when they carry all these medical supplies and stuff across the border, it's a, as you can imagine, it can at times be kind of a hassle. But nevertheless, they kind of bring in the drugs and stuff that they need. And, and in the city there, Piedras will supply some of, of those drugs. But whatever they don't use, they have to kind of give back. And it's, you know, it's really high accountability and all. And 
and because of her influence, the last time they were there, she just said, look, what's the stuff that's left over, y'all just keep. I know you're going to be back. We trust you. Like, you just take care of that and bring that with you. Like, that was a huge help. She's using her influence because in God's times for her, before she ever knew it, before she ever knew Christ, that God was positioning her. God setting the times for her promotion, for influence, for his purposes. It's a pretty incredible theme. So uh, let's just kind of wrap up with two key statements. Here's the two key statements that we want to walk away from. That in a godless story, events appear to be what? Random. In a godless story, if you view life that God is absent, God's not present, events just appear to be random. But the second is that in God's story, events are arranged for a reason. When you believe that God ultimately is telling a story, that what he's weaving that looks chaotic from our earthly perspective is actually a beautiful story of what he's doing for his purposes. And that's kind of the the second idea. Um, Kathy and I, I've told you this before, but Kathy and I both come from broken homes. And uh, we both have parents who really loved us, but nevertheless, uh, there was a break in the marriage. And uh, you know, my mom never remarried. My dad re- married. He's in his third marriage. Uh, married three times. Uh, Kathy's uh, father married seven times. Uh, left the family when, when she was five years old, I think. Uh, nine. Five to nine. <laughs> if this was second hour and she wasn't here, it wouldn't have mattered. But <laughs> It's like you have a fact checker right here. Okay, so she was nine. So anyway, like, you know, that's, that's a difficult background. Many of you have had, you know, same kind of backgrounds, family break. But anyway, like, we, we grew up, um, we didn't know what Christian marriage, Christian family, Christian parenting was supposed to look like. And uh, we had what felt like a pretty hard. Like, that's, nobody desires to come from that background. But God used that in our lives. First of all, like, he made us really hungry to find out what is marriage supposed to look like? Uh, what is parenting? Like Jake came home on our first year anniversary. We started parenting very young. I was 22 years old. Like we didn't know like how to do this thing. It made us very hungry to get biblical instruction about marriage, about parenting. And then in God's timing and God's promotion, I find myself involved in family ministry, like working to try to help people build strong marriages to build strong parenting, have a biblical philosophy of family life, like those become the very things that I give much of my life to even today. So like God takes things in our lives, things that, that we would never think could be woven together for his purposes, and he weaves them together. And if you will open your eyes... If you will look through the lens of faith, if you will turn the tapestry over and believe that God is doing something and wants to do something and weaving all the different things in your life, the things that have hurt you, that you are still resentful about, that you can still at times go into this fantasy in your head about revenge and your jaw gets tight. Like if you will let that go and say, God, how are you wanting to use this? How can I pass on comfort to others for the comfort I'm trusting you for? That you're into, you're up to something really big. How can you do that? Uh, What I want to do is just spend some time in prayer. Would you just uh, close your eyes and get quiet before God? Would you do that for me? Let me just say to you, all of you here today, as you just get quiet before the Lord, do you think that your presence here today is a random event? Or do you think that God has worked to arrange you being here? And that, especially those of you who maybe maybe you're interested in God, but you've never come to a point of placing your faith alone in Jesus alone for your salvation, for your forgiveness of sin, having a meaningful life, that God wants you to learn about what a wonderful God that he is. And that he has this loyal, hesed 
covenant love that he wants to offer you. And he wants you to experience that. And that's why Jesus, the Son of God, went to the cross. He died to pay the penalty for our sins so that all who believe in him would have their sins forgiven and eternal life and a meaningful life right now, believing that God wants to use them for his grand purposes. And I just pray that in the quietness of your own heart, where you stand, where you sit, if that's the desire of your heart, that you would simply say, God, I believe that you exist. That I'm not living in a godless story. You are present in my life. And that you love me and you proved it by sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. You raised him from the dead. That in the same way that he was resurrected to life the same way you're giving me brand new life. Not just a home in heaven as great as that is, but right now, a chance for meaningful, purposeful life. And Lord, I want that. Jesus, will you come into my life? And if that's the desire of your heart, and that's the faith that you've expressed, welcome to the family of God. Father, thank you for what you're teaching us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand with me as we prepare to dismiss today? May God take the truths that you've heard today and may his spirit just plant them deeply in your heart so that it gives uh, results, so that it, it, it sprouts, that it bears fruit into life change.